Hi, I'm your host, Ray Dogum, and welcome to Vibecast. Thank you for joining us as we explore the exciting advancements in technology-enabled collaboration to excel important drug development. Vibebio seeks to find every cure for every community. We think big as no one should be left behind in the pursuit of living a healthy, happy, and productive life free from disease. Collectively, we have the skills, we have the technology, and we have the passion. We now need the community catalyst to bring that all together. That's Vibe. We see a future where communities of biopharma experts and patients collaborate to identify high potential medicines and have the ability to access capital on demand to develop them. The Vibecast is our weekly informational podcast where we explore some of the hottest topics in drug development and technology innovation with some of the dynamic people that make up the Vibe community. Join us to learn, imagine, question, and help us identify and develop solutions together. Our guest today is Neil Bandar. Neil is the founder and solo general partner of Utopic Ventures, which is a new pre-seed VC fund that invests the first $50,000 to $100,000 in biotech startups led by scientist CEOs. He was previously the founder of Labdoor, one of Y Combinator's first scientist-led startups, and Abomine, a contract research lab that was acquired for $30 million in 2016. Neil, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I am so excited to talk to you. Uh, there's a few other things I didn't mention in the intro. One is you're also active in politics in Michigan, which is quite interesting because of your father, who's a, a Democratic um, congressman there. And yep. you're also writing a book called The World's Biggest Problems. So mm-hmm. in addition to all that, is there anything else you'd like to share about your background before we get started with some questions? Yeah, yeah, just a, a little bit about me. I'm born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I watched uh, my dad kind of run testing labs my whole life. So when I was two years old, uh, he quit his job in, as a PhD chemist and started a one-person testing lab. Um, and so, you know, I used to, I, I was a hockey player growing up. And so I used to like actually like roller skate in this like open space, like the the empty space that would eventually become the lab. And he kind of like had gotten this this kind of open warehouse and kind of started with a one room lab and started like building it up over time and got it to, you know, 50 plus people in 10 years kind of bootstrapping it along the way and kind of really saw this idea of a scientist CEO, you know, the idea of a lab and a business and how it could run together. Uh, and it was really exciting. Uh, you know, in 2006, I went to University of Michigan to get a molecular biology and business degree. Um, was kind of excited to start a biotech company. That was like really my dream. That was like what I was looking to do. Uh, and then my dad lost kind of all of his businesses in the 2008 recession. Uh, and so he, you know, he'd taken Bank of America financing to uh, do some acquisitions between 2000 and 2008 after bootstrapping for 10 years. Uh, and a $100 million plus business with $24 million in bank loans is a very good business. Uh, but when the bank kind of takes over after a few bad months, they can sell it for $25 million if they want to get their $24 million. Uh, and we were basically back to square one. Uh, and so in 2010, it was uh, basically me and my dad, the only thing we could do was like, we started a two-person testing lab in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, and that was evening. Uh, and that that was the business that we started. We grew to, you know, in two years, it was 15 plus people and profitable, never took any VC angel funding just kind of scaled it, grew it uh, with the business and exited in 2016 and gave gave him the freedom to do his new career uh, and gave me the space to start my own business. That's so interesting. Now, I have a question for you. Did your dad need to persuade you to you know work with him or was that something you were interested in initially? So, no, it, it, I, I think we were both on board right away. I think we're both that kind of person, whereas like in 2008, 2009, one, uh, like, and there's a kind of a whole kind of backstory to this, but uh, when my mom died when I was eight years old. And so like, we have this kind of unique kind of family bond where even when I was, you know, 10 years old, like, we would have like really adult conversations between me and my dad. And like, that also went, uh, like, not just kind of in personal stuff, but also like, I got very interested in business early on. So at like 10, 11, 12 years old, like, I would want to ask him questions about the business and like hard questions about like, what does it mean to like to fire someone or like how would you know when it's like uh, like that's okay or the right time or not uh and just kind of learning that all the way through it it was kind of it became normal for kind of me to ask him for advice or even him to ask me for advice and so when in 2008 2009 2010 i remember vividly like 
like leaving class or like and like pacing the halls and like going on these like long phone calls with my dad just like strategizing like what do we do like what can we do next you know uh and that kind of led to just automatically like 2010 like as soon as i graduated we were like saturday may 1st i remember it was like i graduated like diploma all that kind of stuff and it was like monday we were working on the lab you know it's like we were back and forth between ann arbor and detroit looking for locations looking for lab equipment we needed cheap lab equipment so we we eventually found like a, a company that had gone out of business that had like left all of their equipment just like in a building and it it would like it caused problems for both sides it was like the person wanted to rent the space but couldn't rent it because there was this all this lab equipment and there's like this person who like owned all this lab equipment who had gotten it like after the loan and we're like we can solve both of your problems like we will buy this equipment and then we will rent your space and we will stay here <laughs> right and we, that's literally what we did and we like cleaned up all the equipment it was like a mess they people just like left it one day like as a lab it was like there were like chemicals like in the cabinets and like we had to th- it was a whole thing and we just like did it ourselves like the two of us like cleaned up this lab and got started and like the first month we had one customer and like you know we did two the next month and on and on and made it happen that's really interesting and it's obvious that you have a special bond with your father so that's really great and you're yeah. both willing to like roll up your sleeves and you know get down and dirty and work on um whatever needs to be worked on um yeah. so i'm wondering how does you know your relationship with your father inform your perspective on the life sciences innovation policy space and then also in your investing as well yeah i think it's been relatively recent right so if he we sold the business in late 2016 uh we're democrats right like he got really motivated by the trump election 2018 he wanted to run so then like 2020 he wins a state house seat so he's kind of really ramping up what i like we joke about it but it's like the minor leagues right it's like and like kind of like trying to take a quick ramp up to the majors which is and like the U.S. Congress kind of is that that setting, and so he just won that seat end of twenty two, and so he's been in Congress, you know, five months now. It's exciting to like see different things. I was able to like take my kids, and we saw the the speaker votes, and like we were up to sit sit up in the the House Gallery and different things. Uh, all it's so it's, it's a blast. Uh, and then like again, like we like love rolling up our sleeves, and so like I'm immediately thinking about like what new bills can we introduce and like so i've been like really excited about like organizing that and so i think there's investing things that we really need like i as a founder hated accredited investor laws right this this real gap where it's like only 10 percent of americans can invest in startups you have to either pass a wealth or an income test in order to invest in startups which is really backwards in my mind and it causes like one just like really hard to fundraise for a small company and two like hard to build wealth if you like if you were an uber driver in 2010 and you wanted to put 5k in uber it would have been a million bucks now right and but you couldn't make that investment uh and so that's those types of things i would love to see fixed through and it's like congress sec can solve that Uh, and so those are the things i'm looking at and then and then like the FDA has all these issues, right? Uh, so it's like, can we solve those types of problems? Can we solve, like, how do you get uh, more like these, uh, there are going to be so many more biotech companies that are going to be applying to the FDA in the next 10 years, right? I would expect applications are going to like triple, quadruple or more, right? In the next 10 years versus it like doubled in the last 10 years, which is already exciting, but it's like, that's ramping right now. And so if we get these, like, if the FDA is going to get like five X more applications in the next 10 years, right? We got to ramp the FDA. We've got to get ready for that. Uh, so all those are the things that I'm excited about pushing more in politics now. Totally. And, you know, anyone I talk to that has worked with the FDA or, you know, has had meetings with the FDA, it's a slow process. And thinking that it's going to quadruple the volume of biotechs that reach out to them, getting, you know, requesting approval for drugs or or whatnot, therapeutics, um, how are they going to scale? You know, that's sort of like a problem that they're probably facing now. I don't know. You could think of AI maybe helping with that in some ways, but they're probably slowly looking at that, not very quickly. Um, what are some of the bills specifically that you're actually interested in? You mentioned the accredited investor laws, you know, modifying that. And by the way, that makes sense because, you know, um, someone can spend like millions of dollars on lottery tickets, but they can't necessarily invest in a company for like a hundred thousand. Um, so it's kind of weird. Yeah. It's been crazy. And you can even do like, you can buy like Robin hood. You can do like, you can get on your phone right now and, and buy like margin options. I right? like it's crazy. So that part of it, I think, and startup investments are better, right? It's like, we talk about like, 
Uber in the public markets, like when public at 80 billion and now is at 60, like you could have invested at a $4 million valuation like right a long time ago, right? And so it's like, there's, it's more of a scale of the problem. It's like, I'd no matter what I'd say, like as a startup investor, whatever amount of pool of capital, if you have 10,000, I would split it up into a hundred, hundred dollar investments. That's like, I think the right way to make a portfolio. So like, no matter what I recommend, like, smart investing and like diversification, all those things, but it's like, do it at the right stage. Like if you split, you know, a hundred dollars each into like a hundred public companies, you're not going to get the value as if you split those into a hundred startups. Interesting. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, let's change gears a little bit and talk about your upcoming book that you're working on. Um, you know, I looked at your website. It's very interesting. You kind of have this like list of a hundred, um, was it 20 problems and a hundred solutions. Yeah. So um, can you talk more about that? And maybe, also identify which specific problems or solutions people are most interested in or are you getting the most traction with? Yeah, absolutely. So so one, it was like a personal project that I think had been going for like 10 plus years. Like I liked this idea of, I think it originally started as like, eight, there, there's a Richard Feynman quote is like, you should keep like your 12 favorite problems in your head at all time. And like, like you'll you'll just like lead them in the back of your head and like sometime you'll get some like insight and like people think you're a genius. And it's just because you like leave those 12 problems in the back of your head all the time. And so this was like something I read in college. And so I like sat down in college and like tried to make my own list of 12 problems. And then like in a very classically me thing, like the list like grew to 16 and then eventually grew to 20. And like, I've kind of got it solid at 20 now. And then like two years ago, I just like published the list of 20 problems uh, and started like adding solutions to it along the way. And then like have been getting more and more feedback. I kind of tweet about it. I write about it. Um, people give me ideas on like what should be done because it's like an idea in the back of my head. Like if I read a really interesting, you know, article about, uh, you know, like vision technology, I'll be like, oh, maybe that should be higher on the list, you know? And like, it kind of like, I might, I reorganize the list every once in a while. Like I'll go in quietly and kind of like, oh, that should be 20 spots higher or 10 spots higher. So it's like very subjective. It's obviously like my rankings. Um, and it kind of comes from lab where like I built a whole business around like rankings uh, and grades. But yeah, I think it's just it was my process on like and I was starting a new business. I was going to do something new and I wanted to like figure out like truly what are the world's biggest problems and how can I solve as many of them as possible in the in my lifetime? And I think the more and more I got excited about the one like what I call the meta problem, I kind of pulled it up to the top until it became problem number one. So I call it the money problem. Right. It's like the money problem is like there's a problem which is like the gap between where you are and where you want to be like where you are and where your potential is right mm -hmm. and like that gap that potential gap that potential energy if you could unlock that potential energy in like everyone in the world like that could actually be like the key solution one of the world's biggest problems and i thought like in many cases like that is a tiny tiny amount of money like if you actually go to like a, a place in africa or india like it might be like a hundred dollars a month, ten dollars a month might actually be a gap to actually change. Well, someone might actually like like something like Kiva is like a really interesting potential solution to like micro loans in a place where like five hundred or a thousand dollars actually like changes someone's life to where they start a business and move forward, right? So I think that's a really interesting solution. I like I'm a big Kiva donor. I like love solutions like that. I think we should have more like that. So there's like that solution. So there's like the bottom of the pyramid solution to the money problem. And I think if you like work your way up that solution, I think for like scientists, for like very smart people, like fifty to one hundred thousand dollars for a founder is like an amazing gap. It's like you might quit your company and start a new business. You might drop out of college and start your first startup, right? For a scientist, you might actually spin out and start up a biotech company where you wouldn't otherwise do it. And so I was kind of like looking at the multiple solutions to the money problem. And I was like specifically felt that this like the money problem, which is uh, like a founder accelerator is like first fifty to hundred thousand dollars in biotech for scientists CEOs is like a core problem that I could solve. And like the customer, which is the scientist CEO, is like me. It's like who I've been for the last twelve years. It's like who my dad is. It's like I really like empathize with the scientist CEO. And so if like if I can then you know raise a five million dollar pre-seed biotech fund invest in, you know, 10 of the best biotech companies every year at the first check, first fifty hundred thousand dollars $100,000. One, I can just like help those 10 companies, help those founders 
you know, co- if they want to get into Y Combinator, I, I can help coach them. Like, so like I've had that background. I'm one of the YC's top 10, like recommenders in terms of like who, how many people I recommend to YC. Right. And so I've, I've been doing that over many years and kind of building up that reputation. And so just like, I have this great pipeline of like, you know, a thousand plus biotech founders reach out to me every year. And like, I might meet 250 of them a year and like 50 of them, I might help apply to YC, 10, you know, five to 10 of them get in. I invest in as many of them as early as possible. And is a great VC fund can be created out of that. And then it can scale to, I wrote this, like, I think I could create a billion dollar seed fund. Like, I think if you scale first check, it, you could do first check for everything and you could 50 to $100,000 at for every new company kind of like that I think is like, you know, YC grade, the same way that very like YC like model, but almost like one step earlier than YC, I think is an extremely valuable spot to be. Uh, and so that's, that's what I would love to be doing long term. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. And I think, you know, it's not just the funding that you're helping these founders with, you're also helping with, you know, validating their idea, kind of helping guide them on their journey as an entrepreneur. And, you know, as you said, connecting them with um, YC potentially or other uh, investors as well. So that's really helpful, I think. Um, So, you know, I guess one question would be like, how do you scale that due diligence process? So you're putting in 50 or 100K into these companies from, you know, fresh companies, right? How do you, how how are you able to look through all these companies uh, so quickly and decide whether or not they're worth the investment? Yeah, so I built a very inbound structure for me, right? So I think that's how I can kind of field it best is I basically my writings and I've got over a hundred posts, right? The world's biggest problems is a great way to organize them. I think that's like a really great, anyone who wants to be a writer, I would say like, there's a great uh, Bisa, a friend of mine uh, is like, this idea, he has this idea of like, you should do a hundred things before you like call yourself a writer. Like if you want to be a YouTuber, make a hundred videos. Like if you want to be a podcast to make a hundred podcasts, right? Like Been once there. you do, <laughs> right? like once you do a hundred, then you're like, I'm a pro. I know how to do this. I know if I like it or not, like to do more, you know? Um, and so like, and then once you get to a hundred and like, I got to a hundred, then it's like the next hundred, I was like, well, now I got to organize this and like make it something bigger. Right. And so that's when I'm starting to organize it into the world's biggest problems. And so like the next hundred will like make this book full. Right. Uh, And then I'll have like a full book that I can share. And so so I think similarly, I think like thinking through the, like, how do you do the like first hundred kind of companies or like, it's kind of like, I'm going to learn a lot in like the getting this, like the, as the first hundred companies come through my funnel, I think it's now like that being said, because my top of funnel is so big, like, you know, I'm seeing like hundreds or thousands of companies. Right. And so I'm funneling down, I think like stage and sector matters a lot, right? Like because of like, I'm just looking at biotech, I'm just looking at first stage, I'm just looking at like 5 million or lower valuations. Like if this is like a hotshot spin out out of, you know, Harvard and it's going to raise a million at 10 and, or like it's already in YC and it's at a 15, I like, I missed it and it's fine. I could help them as like a friend or like an advisor, but like me personally, like I want to like use my filter to like force myself as early as possible so that like now once I'm in that zone in my like sub 5 million first check zone, then I'm really just looking at like, who's the best scientist CEO. And that's like, that's my filter It's like, now I'm like further filtering down to who's the best scientist CEO. And I can get down to like my good sense of like, who can make the 10 year run. Like I like the 10 year run as a scientist CEO, we've got like recursion and twist and solugen and ginkgo bioworks and like, those are all the PhD scientist CEO running billion dollar companies, like public companies in some cases, like doing S1s, doing like quarterly earnings. And like, that's a scientist. Like that came straight out, like recursion came straight out of a university spin out, University of Utah spin out, right? Like that's exactly what we think is like, oh, uh, like maybe they need a lot of help and like venture creation model to solve that spin out. No, it's like, they spun that out. They fundraise their own money. They went all the way to IPO as a scientist CEO. Um, and so if you can see that in the next generation, that's how you build a venture capital fund. That's awesome. Yeah, I think maybe like 10, 20 years ago it was more difficult for a scientist CEO to be successful. Now I think there are the tools, the community to support them more effectively. So that's really great. And I'm you know, glad that you're doing this as well. Um, how is the current economic environment affecting deal flow and investments into early stage biotechs? 
Yeah, so I saw this there's this great graph that I'd love to share, which is basically uh, the XPI, which is like the the uh, biotech index, the public market index versus the VC market. So it's like biotech VC versus public uh, biotech. And they're like identical, like they go up and down at the same rate. And so basically what's happened is like from 2021, which is like the peak of the public market biotech uh, to now is like both are down over 50%. Right. And so we've like in the last two years, we've seen like a 50 percent decrease in both sides. And what we've got to figure out is one, I think it's like a great time to invest because like the deal flow is, if anything, if I had to judge like deal flow, like last year versus this year, it might be up 50 to 100 percent. Like the early stage angel pre-seed deal flow is actually up. And so if it's if the deal flow is up, but like VC is down 50, 80 percent, it's actually like the best time to invest. Like you like valuations are coming back down, even like YC, like I was seeing like there was very normal five years ago for biotech companies to leave YC with a 15 million dollar valuation. And the same companies that were like raising at a five before, like couldn't raise one on five before we're raising, you know, two, three on 15 like six months later after YC, which is like why I recommend YC to biotech companies. In 2021, like all of a sudden it was like 25 to some people were like stretching to 40, 50, like at the really high end. And so that that came right back down. And now like this batch, it was like everyone was raising a 15 again. Right. And so it's like as long as that's happening, I think that's great. But like again, I still have to go for my stage, which is one stage earlier, it's even better. It's like even more exciting, which is like we're getting like the new batch of biotech 2.0 companies are coming out. And so like the costs are coming down to where the 50 to 100K goes further than it used to, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm getting more and more pitches where it's like, I'm spinning up on AWS and like, I actually, and they're like, oh, I've got 100K in free credits already because of this X, Y, Z, you know? And like, as soon as that runs out, then like, I've got another 100K in credit, free credits I'm gonna get from this other place. And then I'm gonna need 100K in funding. And that's like all I need to like actually build my model to get to preclinical. Like, and so that's like what I see my zone is, is like if phase one is like, you know, $4 million, let's say for a pharma, like nowadays, like the preclinical might be able to be done for like 50K to 500K, right? Like in that zone. Depending on the, the technology, but yeah, sure. Right. And so, and like it's dropping, right? Like the 500 might be dropping to like some of these things might be proven to where, and I'm even potentially trying to go a stage before that, which is like I'm trying to fund the preclinical. So it's like what I'm seeing is actually just like an experimental proof of concept. So I'm like, I'm a stage before. And it's like, I'm kind of, I'm taking you from like experimental proof of concept to the preclinical. And that's like, that's my like baton pass. Um, so, and then like, then from there, it's like, if you can do that during your YC class, then you can like three to six months raise a, a good ser a seed round. You can do that. You can raise, you can get to phase one, raise a good series A and you're like off and running. And then, so that's like in hardest conditions, like hard fundraising conditions, pharma. If it's industrial, biotech is even easier, right? Like then the fundraising is even easier on the stages afterward. Um, I mean, if you're Solugen, you're still gonna raise 400 to $600 million. I don't begrudge that. Uh, and the winner, whoever's like the big winners in my VC uh, fund out of the 50 are probably gonna end up raising hundreds of millions of dollars, right? And so I think the core is to, you know, just get, you know, strong single digit ownership as early as possible and just ride these companies all the way. Uh, and, you know, a few of these companies are going to really, really uh, pay for the rest. That's great. Can you talk more about actually utopic ventures? Like how much funding do you have now? And like, what's the mission behind it? And also maybe also what, what is your, uh, what kind of founders are you looking for? Yeah, absolutely. So I think we've talked about some of this already, but I can put it all together, which is, uh, you know, $5 million pre-seed fund to invest the first $1,500,000 in biotech startups led by scientist CEOs. Uh, and so really, yeah, so it's 50 plus companies in this portfolio of $5 million. Uh, it's really meant to be a test of like proving that this model works. Like it's a, as focused as possible. 5 million is like, frankly, very small for a VC fund, right? It's like really meant to be like the way that my startups are. It's like, if they're doing their first 1500K, like a first 5 million, fund is like an angel pre-seed fund. It's like the very earliest stage fund. And then I'm specifically trying to make my focus biotech, ideally biotech 2.0 as much as possible. And then like scientist CEOs as much as possible. Uh, and so that puts me into this, I think extremely valuable sub niche of uh, companies where if I can put 50 companies together in this fund, 
I would love to, you know, raise a larger second and third fund and build out. And I would, I think every VC, when they scale, they tend to scale vertically, right? So they tend to get like, when they have a 50 million, 100 million, billion dollar fund, they just have like uh, a billion dollar fund just in biotech, right? And I, what I would do is go horizontally. I'd want to be like first check for everything. So it's like, basically like if, like why commentators on this, to some extent, they've been like, they're horizontal, but as they've gone horizontal, they've gone up. So they're like, they were like for like $20,000 checks just for hackers. And then they became $100,000 checks for everyone. And then they became $500,000 checks for everyone. And so they're now they're like a higher bar on the horizontal line. And I basically just want to be like the, the bottom bar uh, again and like go back to like original YC terms. That's great. For anyone who's listening, who might not be familiar with YC. Y Combinator is like a prestigious accelerator. They've been around for uh how many years? Tell tell the audience. Uh, so it founded in 2005. I went through the program in 2015. Uh, and that was kind of an important inflection point. So now it's known as a company, like they now they invest in 500 companies a year, $500,000 each. So it's like $250 million a year fund. They started like 2005 with a million dollar fund. They invested in, you know, eight companies, $20,000 each. So they didn't even invest the whole fund. They, like they were going to invest that over multiple years. By year nine, which is 2014, they were still investing out of a three million a year fund, and they it was only in 2014 that they raised a much larger fund. They started in 2014, 2015, investing 120k for seven percent. That was like the first inflection point. Then they started doing 100 companies a year. Now they do 500 companies a year, uh, and so they've kind of ramped over a 20 year period. And that was like in 2014, 2015, it was still like not certain whether it was going to be successful or not. Now it's like very obvious. It's kind of like if you looked at Amazon in year eight or nine, you were like, maybe you didn't know. Like that, if, if you were in, on the inside, it was very clear that it was going to be successful. And I felt the same way about YC in 2015. From the inside, it looked obvious that it was going to be successful. And like now everyone sees it. Uh, and I think the same thing is kind of true in the like going back to the roots of YC is like if you went back to the I like even the 20K check is interesting to me, but like 50 to 100K minimum is like to be safe. Uh, that's that bar of like 50 to 100k for everyone. Uh, I think is just again just a huge opportunity, and it, both in terms of like it's a great investing opportunity. Like YC has done incredibly, and probably I think like if you had to compare even like YC versus Sequoia or, or like like I think YC probably beats them in terms of like absolute returns and like definitely relative returns. Uh, but what I would love to see is like if you could go even earlier than that. It's also what like the founder connection you have. Like I have a great connection to YC and like they like changed who I am as a founder and made me a better founder and it made my network. And like, I like attribute a lot of my success to like YC and I'm like, I'm happy to give the 7% to them for that, right? And it's just like, you want to be that person. Like if, if you as an investor, if you can be in that class or even earlier than that class and like try to do the harder work earlier uh, to get in the game, uh, I think it's a really, really valuable place to be. Yeah, it's so interesting. I'm sure like 20K now wouldn't really go far for most companies. Um, so yeah, it's really cool to see that how how much they've grown. Uh, so, you know, going back to, you know, your activity, do, doing due diligence with companies, what are some red flags that investors should be cautious about when, you know, diligencing a potential biotech startup? I think for, for me, I can't, uh, if a deal is kind of moving too fast or is like, it's a really hot deal and it's like the price is going up really fast. It just, I end up missing those. Um, and I kind of purposely built my, my filters to kind of just miss like a lot of those things. And it's same thing goes for like category. Like there's like a ton of like the hot new, like SaaS or FinTech companies hit my inbox. And I can just like completely ignore it and don't have to worry about it. Um, and I'm probably missing good deals, but it's just like how I have to focus. Um, and so I think like some of my things are like, I don't even try to like take it too personally. I just like, it's just like, it's just like uh, blinders or filters and I just uh, trust the filters. Uh, and so like, that's a huge part of my process down. I think after that, it's just, I think it's the pieces, like you start seeing the speed. Um, so it's like uh, this, for me, it's like, I think a core is being able to like, like how quickly is the founder accelerating? Like how many, how quickly are they taking each step? uh that i need that like to happen because like i'm i'm not able to like drive the process at all like for my founders like the best it's not just scientists ceos like the best founders in general like basically they are going to like run the business themselves like there's this like i think lie that vcs tell everyone which is like the like we're very value add and like mm. uh you know it's like i 
I would like challenge VCs to give me an ex a single example of a company that like is in their portfolio that is a billion dollar portfolio company because of them. Like it wouldn't, it's like, I don't think so. I like you right. invest in the company and then they became a billion dollars. They would have been a billion dollar company without you. Like the replacement value of you as a, as a VC is probably pretty low, right? Like the core to the value of a VC is like getting in early and like being first and fast and all these different things. And so for, for me, like that's my process is like, I have to see the founder is just like sprinting with or without me. Like they're going to succeed with or without me. They don't really need me. Like they're asking me for help. They're proactively pushing me, uh, but they don't need me. Versus like, if I have to like push the process at all, I generally speaking will just like drop it. Like, I just don't have the time. Like if it's like a, one or two emails and it's like getting difficult, I just will miss it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, especially if you have so many companies in your portfolio. So, you know, you just don't have the time in the yeah. day. So that makes sense. Um, what kind of support do early stage companies really need to make them successful though? So you mentioned how, um, you know, you're providing some of that by helping them find VCs potentially as well, like future VCs, but anything else like services wise or coaching wise or yeah. yeah it's like very spiky. It's like, I think that's the thing is mm. like, I think this, it's sold as this like, and that's how like, especially like these big growth VCs, they like build this structure and there's like teams and like uh, all to just like seemingly provide value. And it's like, what is the actual value is like, when like SVB goes down on a Friday night and like someone's freaking out on a Saturday, it's like taking the founder calls and like counting people down. And like, it's, you know, yes, it's like YC deadline was like three weeks ago. And like on that, that week, that Monday through Friday, I probably looked at 50 plus applications just that one week. Right. There's like, there's like urgency around certain dates or certain times uh, or like someone's doing their seed or series A and they like need one, two, three key things. Right. So it's like, I'm not, I'm not your like 10 hour a month, like person, right? Like, that's not what I'm doing. It's like, but it's like a few times a year, you like send me an email and you need help. And it's like, I'm, I'm on it. I've like, it's like, or it's like some piece of information. And like, I seem to know it, or like I have the connection or a second or third degree and I'll find it for you. Uh, yeah. I just like try to be there. And so for 10 founders a year, 50 founders a batch, like, I think it scales to hundreds of companies. Like I've been surprised at like my own investors, right? It's like, Mark Cuban led our seed round at Labdoor, Floodgate led our Series A, Y Combinator. Uh, That's awesome. Right? Like, we've got these great investors. And it's like, I'm the same way with them, where it's like, I don't, I send monthly investor update emails. They're all very good at answering. They don't answer, they, they're very spiky about it. Like, I might get like a one sentence or two sentence answer, email answer back from Mark Cuban, but it'll be like within an hour or within minutes from like when I send my investor update email to everyone. It's just like a mass email. Right. And it's like, if I send a personal email, it, it can be even faster. Right. And so it's like, that's what we need from our investors is like, I want to be that kind of Mark Cuban floodgate type investor, where it's like, I'm like, even though they they each have YC has thousands of companies, Mark and, and floodgate have hundreds of companies, like they're still within an hour or less, like responsive every time. That's what you need. And, and then like, don't bother me the other times. Right. Like that's, that's basically what a founder. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah, it's kind of like a, a bit hands off, but also like when they really need it, you're there as well. You're not like ignoring them. It's funny you mentioned Mark Cuban. Actually, I emailed him a couple months ago asking him to he was interested in you know talking to me about a on a podcast, yeah. and he's like he responded pretty quickly. I think it was like within a few hours and said hit me up next summer or hit me up later this year in the summer or something like that. He's really busy, so he yeah. does. Answer. It's pretty cool. He, it does answer, and then even then, like if you go and follow up, like yeah. I've, that happened to us too. It was like. I met Mark Cuban in 2012. We like literally crashed a, a party. It was like a Super Bowl, like at the Super Bowl in Indianapolis. And I was in Michigan. I drove down to Indianapolis. There was like a Shark Tank viewing party. He like crashed a couple lines of like a security to get to and like got to talk to Cuban and told him about my lab. And he basically had the same kind of concept. So it was like, this was when I was doing Avamade. And he was like, if you ever like a B2B lab is interesting, but if you ever do a consumer focused lab, let me know. Right. And that like was so much as like nine months later, I just like emailed him back and was like, hey, we actually did it like labbro.com. Like, here's the link, you know, and it, that's I think what he really likes is like if you can like come back to him and be like, we did it. We did X, Y, Z that we said we we're going to do. Um, here it is. Like he invested pretty quickly off of that and he like let our seed around and all these different things. Uh, and so, yeah, it's like if you can be that person for other people. Right. Like that's somewhere between like Mark Gibbon, Paul Graham, Ron Conway. There's like a few of these people 
who have made like tech startups so much better, right? And so if you can like be that for biotech startups, that's that's the aspiration. That's great. You know, I have one more question before we sort of wrap up uh, this this podcast. What kind of specific technologies do you see making the biggest impact on human health in the next few years? Yeah, so I think I just wrote about this in my biotech 2.0 post. So I think it's like everything in biotech 1.0, I feel like was very um, mass produced, right? It's like one to many, um, which kind of was like web 1.0. It's like everyone gets Netscape, everyone's on AOL, everyone's on the same things, right? And then it's like web 2.0 is like everyone gets to create their own stuff. And it's like, we're all like making, it's like all platform based and more. And then like web three is like truly decentralized is what we're trying to get to. Right. And I think like biotech is going through like the same kind of transition where like 1.0 is like same COVID vaccine for everyone. Right. And like 2.0 is going to start becoming this, like everyone gets their own personalized cancer vaccines. Right. Like we're going to start. So it's like, and that it's both on the like therapeutic side. And then I like thinking about it split into like testing and therapeutics. Right. So there's like the testing is like testing gets much cheaper. So it's like molecular diagnostics and things like that. Whereas like we're going to read our own sequencing and all this kind of stuff. So it's like this is all, all the like the same way the dot com era is like you need 30 years of cost to come down from Morris Law to like make all this possible. It's like we was like Human Genome Project 1990. It's like we got 30 years down. Right. And so like now we've got the cost cheap enough where like you can sequence everyone instead of just sequencing one person. Right. And so as that happens, I think it's like we're going to test ourselves. 2.0 is going to be like personalized type stuff. And then Biotech 3.0 is like, I have to write that post later. Like, I truly believe that's coming. It's like truly like, I don't know, like molecular robots changing your body and like the matrix and singularity and all that kind of stuff. Like I can see all that in, in the 50 to 100 year future. Like we're really, really there. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And just thinking about the singularity, I think like Ray Kurzweil made that famous or coined that term. Uh, and he expected it to happen in like the year 2042 or something like that. What are your thoughts about that? I'm curious. Uh, it, it might are be going to be, you know, merging with the machine at some point? I don't. So I would hope not merging on it. So like this, like merging with the machine thing, like I would almost like us to be like cybernetic in some ways. Like for me, what I would love to see is like, mini robots like going through my body and like cleaning things up versus like me like morphing into a larger figure um that's how my vision i see it uh so i would say like 2.0 is like just starting now so like everything in kind of biotech feels to me like 20 to 30 years behind tech um and so i think like so it's like 1999 we like web 2.0 was coined and like really it was like 2004 to 2007 with like YC in 2005, iPhone 2007, that was like web 2.0. So it's like 2030 ish, we'll like really get biotech 2.0 started. Like 2025, like I'm trying to call biotech 2.0 now. Like I'm trying to, the same way that 1999, we call it, someone called uh, Darcy Benucci called uh, web 2.0, where it's like, I want to call biotech 2.0. So it's like, if that's 2030, yeah, like 20 year run on that. And then I think like we're on web 3.0, I think we're still too early a little bit, right? It's still like five, maybe five, 10 years out. Um, and then we're going to go on a 20 year run on, on web three. Um, and then, yeah, another 20 years past that for biotech three. So yeah, I'm, I'm closer to the end of the, the century on the singularity, but that's how I do my math. Yeah. Exciting times for sure. No matter how you look at it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. um, Neil, thank you so much for this conversation. I really appreciate your time. Is yeah. there anything else you would like to share? We didn't discuss today, or is there any way that people can reach out to you? Yeah, absolutely. So if you're a scientist CEO raising your first $1,500,000, utopicvc.com, it's an open application, something we absolutely believe in, right? And so, and it it all goes to me, right? So we're really funneling kind of, if you're kind of, especially biotech 2.0, uh, if you're investing in kind of molecular diagnostics, gene therapies, kind of working on the future of biotech, I would love to talk to you. So apply there and we're going to be kind of doing our first close this summer, first investments this fall, uh, 10 a year pace. Uh, we, we're going to look at hundreds of companies, ideally thousands a year. So it's going to be very competitive, but would love to support 10 of the top biotech companies per year. Uh, and so, so that's utopic. And then for me personally, neilthanador.com is where I've posted 100 plus blog posts over the last 10 years. There's close to 100,000 words on that site now. Uh, and really in the last couple of years have been focused on the world's biggest problems, which is world's biggest problems.com. Uh, and that really goes into the 20 biggest problems and 100 biggest solutions, which if you're working on any of those problems or solutions, DM me on Twitter at Neil Thanadar, 
and just tell me what problem or solution you're working on as like the point of the world's biggest problems is not for like me to solve the hundred problems, but it's like to be a conduit of like excitement and like push and like promote the solutions that are already being created. And so if you're already working on something, reach out to me. I'd love to promote it. That's awesome. And we'll make sure to include those links in the show notes as well as the description on YouTube. And if anyone has any questions or ideas that are generated from today's discussion, please do reach out, you know, like us, comment, subscribe, share us as well. I'm uh, looking forward to, you know, your feedback. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.